suppose there was a big storm and 20% of the roads were blocked by fallen trees. Could you still get anywhere? Or would you just be stuck in your neighborhood? This is the sort of question we are going to study today. How much damage does it take to break a network? And how can we design networks that are not so easy to break? Welcome back to Complexity Papers. And also welcome back to this course on networks and complexity. Right now, I'm in Boston at a workshop that's about resilience of infrastructure. And it's co-funded by the Department of Defense. So I thought that would be the perfect backdrop to talk about attacks on networks. I use the word attack not to refer to military things, at least not necessarily. We use it to describe anything that threatens the integrity of a network, its structural connectedness. And that might be various things. You know, I mean, that might be a storm that disrupts the connectivity of the roads, or it might actually be something like hygiene that disrupts the network across which epidemic diseases are spreading. So how can we actually think about our initial example where fallen trees remove links from our network? Well, fortunately, we have generating functions now. And generating functions makes this a whole lot easier than it would otherwise be. So let's recap how this works. If you have a network with a degree distribution PK, you can write the generating function for this degree distribution as sum over PK x to the k. And we will call this g, the degree generating function. And from this degree generating function, we can also compute the excess degree generating functions. So the generating function for the excess degree distribution. And how do we get q? We can compute q simply as g dash of x divided by g dash n1. From these generative functions, we can then compute the mean degree and the mean excess degree very easily by computing the expectation value. To compute the expectation value from a generating function, you just differentiate it and then put in 1. So our mean degree z is g dash n1, and our mean excess degree q is q dash n1. In the previous video, we've also already seen that generating functions have some amazing tricks up the sleeve. And perhaps the most amazing is this composition rule, or dice of dice rule. So if we want to sum over a random number of random processes, then we can do this by plugging the generating functions into each other. Hmm. To illustrate this, let's look at just our problem here. If you pick a random node from a network and count the number of links on the node, that is kind of like rolling a dice, isn't it? It's a process that gives you a random result. So we can think of the generating function of our degree distribution as a generating function for some kind of dice. Now, in this case where we have some trees blocking links in the road network, well, that is like first rolling a dice for the number of roads you find from a certain intersection. And then for each of the roads, you roll another dice to check if it's still possible or not. So if you do this, you can apply this dice of dice rule, can't you? So we already know the generating function for the dice that determines how many roads we find attached to a randomly picked intersection in our road network, right? That is the network's degree generating function, g. And now let's also write a generating function for the dice that determines if a road is still possible or not. So let's say the probability that a road is blocked is r, r for removed. Then the complementary probability, 1 minus r, is the probability that the road is still free. We can't really use s because we used s for the giant component size. So let's use the symbol c, like c for surviving. Anyway, so we know our probabilities r and c that a road is blocked, that is removed, or that it's still surviving and free to use. Another way to say this is to say that after the trees fall, one road is still one road with probability C, and it has zero roads with probability R. And the generating function for that is R times X to the zero plus C times X to the one. Yeah? Probability R to have zero roads 
probability c to have one road. We will call this generating function a. That is the so-called attack generating function. Now we can use the dice of dice roll and plug this attack generating function into our degree generating function and that gives us the degree generating function after the attack. And we can actually do the same thing for the excess degree generating function. We just take our old excess degree generating function and then we plug in this attack function and that gives us the excess degree generating function after the attack. How does this help us to decide if we still can get anywhere in our road network? Well, you remember that the giant component exists as long as the mean excess degree q is greater than 1. Can we compute this mean excess degree now? Well, of course, we can compute it as the expectation value of the excess degree distribution. And for that, we take our generating function after the trees fall, differentiate it, and put in x equals 1. Yeah. If we do this differentiation, a chain rule happens. Right? We have to differentiate our outer function, the q, and then we have to differentiate our inner function, the attack function a. On this inner derivative, only the constant c, our survival probability, survives, and everything else goes away. That's very neat. Well, and when we plug in 1 now, what happens is on the outer derivative term here, what we get is our old q dash of 1. So our old mean excess degree. So our new mean excess degree after the attack is just the old mean excess degree multiplied with the probability of survival c. So this is a pretty nice result. If we remove a certain proportion of nodes from the network, then the mean excess degree and the mean degree get reduced proportionally. Well, technically we haven't shown this for the mean degree, but you can quickly verify it yourself now if you follow the same calculation just with g instead of q. But now, what about the road network? Well, since I'm in America now, it seems fair to assume that every intersection has four nodes connecting to it. So, our network has only nodes of degree 4, which means it is a 4 regular graph. And the degree distribution is p4 is 1, and all other pk are 0. So, if you write the degree generating function, it just is g is sum over pk x to the k, which turns out to be just x to the 4. If we compute the excess degree generating function from that, we end up with x to the 3. So the mean excess degree is just 3. Which makes total sense, right? If every intersection has four roads connected to it, if you come to a random intersection by following a road, you find three more roads attached to the intersection. Pretty intuitive, isn't it? So, that means our mean excess degree is 3, right? Right from the start. So if we remove 20% of the roads now, that leaves us with 0 0.8 times 3, which is still much more than 1. So, yeah, there's still a giant component in this network. Of course, that there is a giant component doesn't mean my house is still in it, right? In the previous lecture, when we talked about Scottish cows, we have seen that to compute the giant component size, we must first compute the probability that following a random link doesn't lead us to the giant component. And we get this probability v from the equation v equals sum over pk v to the k. And then, if we have v, we can compute the giant component size as 1 minus sum over pk v to the k. So, if you want to know our giant component size after the attack, we can just put in our generating functions q and g after the attack that we already know. I will leave the actual calculation as an exercise. But for our road network, the result is that by removing 20% of the links, we disconnect less than 1% of the intersections. For the road network, these small worldish network calculations are actually a bit dodgy because the road network is strongly embedded in geographical space, right? So it's almost the definition of a large world. But this only means that the result might be a little bit off, maybe a percent or two. I think I am still fine. With 20% of the roads blocked, I could still get basically everywhere. But you know, the calculations get much better when we look at another network, such as 
disease spreading, for instance, right? That happens on a social network that is much less embedded geographically. One of the most interesting properties of an epidemic is its basic reproductive number, R0. R0 is defined as the number of secondary infections a single affected person would cause in a population where the disease is not yet widespread. So we can think of R0 as the mean excess degree of a very particular network. It's not the network of social contacts, but the network of links across which the disease would actually spread if it were given a chance that if one of the nodes on the link got infected. Suppose, for example, we are dealing with a disease where the R0 is 5. How much social distancing do we need to stop this epidemic? So, because R0 is basically a mean excess degree, we can now compute what it would take to stop this disease by social distancing. Say, to stop it, we would need to reduce the mean excess degree below 1. And we know at the moment the mean excess degree is 5. So we need to reduce it by a factor of 5. To do this, well, you know, if we cut a number of links, the mean excess degree decreases proportionally. So we would have to cut 80% of the links at random to stop this disease from spreading. That's quite a lot of distancing. Maybe we can do better if we remove nodes instead, say, by vaccinating people. Node removal is a bit more complicated, but we can make it easier by thinking about it as a two-step process. In the first step, we remove the nodes themselves, but that leaves the links that they were attached to. So we have these broken off stubs of links. And then in the second step, we remove those stubs, cleaning up the network. Okay, let's start with step one. In step one, we only remove the nodes themselves. So let's find out what that does to the degree distribution. For now, let's just assume that we remove nodes randomly. And we will repurpose our parameters such that the removed proportion of nodes is R and the surviving proportion of nodes is C. Let's see what this does to nodes of degree zero. We will start by computing the total number of nodes of degree zero, then we remove a proportion of R of them, and then we divide by the surviving number of nodes in the network to get, again, an element of the new degree distribution. Ready? So if P0 is the proportion of nodes of degree zero in our initial network, then the total number of nodes of degree zero is the number of nodes in the network, capital N, times P0, right? Now, if we remove a proportion R of them, that means we are left with a proportion C. So the number of nodes of degree zero that are left after the removal is C times N times P0. And now to compute our new P0, well, we have to divide by the total number of nodes that are left in the network. And if we randomly removed a proportion R of all nodes, well, that leaves us with a proportion C. So the total number of nodes in the network are now C times N. So if we divide the number of nodes with degree zero that are left in the network by Cn, all the factors cancel, and we are just left with the old P0. Yeah, randomly removing nodes from the network doesn't change the proportion of nodes of degree zero at all. And actually, we could have done the same calculation for nodes of every other degree. So the first step in our two-step removal procedure does not change the degree distribution at all if we are removing nodes at random. After step one, our generating functions g and q are still exactly the same as in our initial network. But now in step two, we have to remove the broken off stops from the nodes. And this will change the degree distribution. Cleaning up the stops means removing some links from the remaining nodes. And because we removed nodes at random, the remaining nodes now lose some links at random. So this is again just random link removal. And we know how to do random link removal, don't we? So this is the same mass as before. The only thing that we need to know now is how many links do we need to remove. But again, we can make this easier by thinking about this in the right way. 
So removing a proportion r of the nodes also means removing a proportion r of the endpoints of links. And now imagine yourself standing on a node, looking at a link, wondering if the endpoint on the other side is still there or not. If it's not there, it's a stub that needs to be removed. So, since we removed a proportion r of the endpoints, we basically also turned a proportion r of the remaining links into stubs. It's really that simple. There's only one difference between random node removal and random link removal. And that is, node removal actually changes the number of nodes, while link removal doesn't. But apart from this, the effects on the degree distribution, the generating functions, the giant components in the remaining network, they are all the same. They all follow the same equations. So in our vaccination scenario, well, if the mean excess degree of our network was five, so an R naught of five for our epidemic, well, if we have an immunizing vaccination, what's the proportion of nodes that we have to vaccinate? Well, we want to bring down the mean excess degree by 80%. And if we do this by node removal, that means we also need to remove 80% of the nodes from the network. We now know how to do the math of random node removal and random link removal. And now that we know the tricks, it's not so hard, is it? We can even combine them now. For instance, if you cut half your links by social distancing, well, that would reduce the mean excess degree of the network by half. And then if you vaccinated half the nodes on top of that, that would reduce it by half again. So that would be a reduction by a factor of four, for instance. Now that we understand these things, I want to leave you with a final diagram. This is what happens if you compute the giant component sizes for two different networks. Both have mean degree three, but one is a regular graph, so it has mean excess degree two, while the other is actually quite heterogeneous. It has a mean excess degree of six. So this happens if we remove a certain proportion of nodes or links, right? We know now that the effects are really the same. So what is shown here is the giant component size in the remaining network. And we can see that the regular graph actually does better in the beginning. If we remove only a few nodes or links, the giant component in the regular graph is bigger. But if we remove a lot, then of course, the giant component in the heterogeneous network survives better. This is interesting, isn't it? The regular graph is almost like glass. It's very hard. If you give it a small attack, almost nothing happens. But it's also brittle. If you attack it too strongly, it collapses. By comparison, the heterogeneous network is almost like foam or something. It's easy to tear parts off. Some parts are even not attached at the beginning. But it's really hard to take it all apart. So regular graphs are hard and brittle. And heterogeneous graphs are soft, but somehow resilient. Now, this creates an interesting dilemma. And actually one that is very characteristic for resilience generally. See, if you want to defend something with a finite amount of resources, then you have to make up your mind how much you want to defend. Do you want to keep everything or do you set priorities? If you want to defend everything, maybe you are successful. But if your defenses are overcome, well, then you might lose a lot. You might lose everything. Your giant component might just disappear. On the other hand, if you set priorities, then you will certainly lose something, but you might keep the rest. So this is the analogy to our regular and heterogeneous networks. So this was the easy part. It will get much more interesting in part two, where we talk about targeted and viral attacks. But before, let's do some exercises and never fail to defend our networks again. Sounds tempting if I put it like this, doesn't it? In any case, see you in the next one.